We always get out of the building. We always made our way out all the time. You know, it wasn't, it didn't seem like it would ever happen to us. On December 3rd, I, re I recall um, we got called in a normal three alarm fire, so it was no big deal. The cold storage building was built in the early 1900s. It was built with very thick walls, 36 inch walls, and it had multiple layers of insulation. The fire started by a homeless couple using a small little campfire for heat. It compounded because they left without telling anybody and just ran off, and we thought people were in the building. Engine one, you're reporting heavy smoke showing in 1816. First alarm came in, they had smoke showing. They went in and did some investigation. And we were coming down Grafton Street, and we're right at the rotary. There was a big plume of white smoke, which is always good, because most building fires, it's black. The rescue company initiated their search of the building. Um, Jerry and Paul went into the roof and just thought, no big deal. They'll just keep on walking down until they find the fire or find their way out. Came around the corner right up the street here on Franklin Street, and I was like, what the hell happened? Everything had gone black. Everything was now black smoke, and I hear guys starting to get a little frantic on the radio. You know, I knew that something changed for the worse. This quickly rose to something that Worcester was never accustomed to. Went running to the front of the building, and this was just about the time that the fourth alarm was being sounded. I was home at the time and got a phone call that there were two people missing. By the time I got to my station to get my gear, there was now six. The coal storage fire was so unique because of how the building was cut up. It was just a uh, cut up building with stairwells that went to different floors and stopped. Just think of yourself in a giant room. If you can't see anything and you get in that room, how do you know how you're gonna get out? We walked in the first floor and it was clear as day. You got to the top of the stairs on the second floor, you couldn't see a thing. It was lights out. You can't see your hand in front of your face. At that point, guys were saying, you know, we're lost, and it was, it was surreal. Apparently, they couldn't find their way back to the stairwell to the roof. They couldn't find their way to the stairwell to the ground floor. Eventually, they called a May Day, and, um, a lot of crews went in looking for them. All the guys came in. I mean, retirees came in to help. Everybody came in to do what they could do. It was a tornado of fire that he saw. It was just a tornado of fire. It was just out of control. You hear the term white hot fire. This was actually white fire, which they estimated between two and 3,000 degrees. These guys were gonna do everything they could to get their brothers out. We wanted to go look for these guys, but that was the worst thing we could have done. Finally, about a, an hour and 45 minutes into the fire, Chief McNamee had the understanding that if they continued, they were gonna lose more than six, many more. And he was like, that's it, everybody out. It was devastating. I, I still really didn't sink in and that they weren't gonna come out. So that's the thing that always stuck out in my mind, just sitting outside right here, the fire was right here, and we were on that street right there looking at it, thinking, all right, they're gonna be in the back, they're gonna open up a side doorway or something. It just never happened. The people that everybody refers to as the Worcester Six were, were actual guys, and it was uh, the first two that we lost were Jerry Lucy and uh, Paul Brotherton, and then the four that we had subsequently lost in searching for them were uh, Tommy Spencer and Timmy Jackson, Jay Lyons and Joe McGuirk. I was making banana breads and the phone started to ring. Paul's cousin had called me. I said, what's up? And she said, nothing, I just heard that there was a bad fire. And they had ticker taped on the bottom of the news that all six families had been notified. And I'm saying to myself, wow, 
Who are the six families? And all I see were blue lights. After December 3rd, uh, starting on the 4th, um, we had to start the whole process of digging out our brothers. The guys from Wuss were unbelievable about how they would come and just work and work and work. And they wouldn't stop. I, I think they went days and days without, without sleeping. There were bobcats up there that would remove the heavy uh, items. And then a lot of firefighters would shovel some of the smaller debris into orange buckets which I hate to today, and it would be taken down to the sifting area. And firefighters would sift it looking for anything, looking, looking for anything. It took us eight days. Paul Brotherton was the last one we found. When we were removing Paul that night, there was a flare up, a fire. It burned for about 30 seconds and went out. The Lord works in strange ways, but the fire was finally extinguished after Paul Brotherton had left the building. Their work and their readiness to respond at any hour of day or night made them our watchmen on the walls. The memorial that took place got to be one of the most memorable and moving events in the history of the city of Worcester. There was 35,000 firefighters uh, from around the world to be here, uh, to stand in solidarity of support with the Worcester Fire Department, the families, and our community. And there was thousands of citizens lying in the streets, thousands of firefighters, and the only sound was marching feet and a guy tolling a bell at the church down at the square. It was, it was just amazing. The weeks after that fire, driving in the station, going to a call, people were clapping and, and saluting us and, and crying on the streets as we drove by. And the community has continued to play that supportive role, wrapping its collective arms around the family and the department. I never thought that would be that way in the city. I, mean, I love Worcester, but I never thought it loved me. <laughs> Weeks turned into months, months turned into years. What got us through was our faith. Everyone deals with grief in their own way. He will never, he will never be out of my heart, you know? On December 3rd, until the day I die, I will always be at that site, on that scene. That's the memorial to me. The decision after the warehouse fire was to create a new fire station here. They were lost doing what they loved to do, which was to provide safety and protection to the people of the city. And that's what the station does. I think he'd be happy to know that's the living memorial. That's the thing that's most important, is to not have it be a statue, but to have it be in service and protect the city of Worcester. My cousin, Jerry Lucy, uh, was one of the six firefighters who died in the Worcester Cold Storage Warehouse fire. Another classmate of mine, Tommy Spencer, also perished in that fire. So this was like our neighborhood. This is part of you know, how we grew up and where we grew up. I think the biggest challenge uh, fighting fires in Worcester, the amount of different types of buildings we have in Worcester. Three deckers that, that are over 100 years old. We have all kinds of warehouses, buildings without windows, extremely dangerous buildings. <laughs> One of the things that Jerry was most concerned about was the lack of funding for training facilities and for equipment. And it was something he, he constantly talked about. At that time here in the city of Worcester, they were using abandoned buildings as a training facility. There just was no money in the budget. And so these guys would take money out of their own households to go and get trained. Jerry did it all the time. He would go and take a class on you know, scuba diving or doing something so that he would be bettering himself. 
By the way, that's not unusual. There are firefighters all over the country who were doing the same thing, helping to outfit themselves, piece of equipment that they don't have that the city won't get them right now, they'll go out and buy it for themselves. The Leary Firefighter Foundation, it is putting dollars in to fill gaps, to create opportunities to train not only Worcester firefighters, but firefighters throughout central Massachusetts and beyond. Do the furthest cut first. For Worcester, for example, there's the burn tower. The burn tower was built so that there would be a place for firefighters to train. It was built very similar to the typical three-decker that you see in Worcester. We have 67 communities that go through that burn tower. How do you fit that into a budget when we've got homeless people? Cutting teachers' positions. He truly supports the fire service. I started the foundation with the idea that one day it would be great to go out of business because firefighters didn't need any more funding, uh, they didn't need new equipment, they didn't need new training facilities, but that's just not true, and that's not true anywhere, almost anywhere in America. Firefighters never go on strike. That's one of the reasons it's the easiest department to, to give a budget cut to, because they're still gonna go to work, and they're still gonna save lives. They will continue to go into burning buildings with whatever they have available to them. I met a fire chief from South Carolina who told me that some of his guys' turnout gear consists of a pair of sweatpants over their jeans. And that was the moment that I said, this can never stop. The Leary Firefighters Foundation has been probably one of the most influential and amazing foundations that we could have ever asked for. They've been there for our family, um, not only our family in the city of Worcester, but the families all around the country. Everything that he's done and the foundation's done has been incredible. We're proud to be Worcester firefighters here, and thank you. I mean, I thought my dad was a superhero, you know? I mean, no matter what, he's coming home. If he's lost, he's lost, but he's gonna find his way home, you know? And um, it didn't really happen. I think early on in the night, if I remember right, I was at like a, a middle school dance or something like that. I was 13, so I, I kind of knew missing back then was basically not looking good, so. Then all of a sudden we saw lights coming down the street and pulling in front of the house. I remember hearing my mother scream. 11. 11 years old, yeah. Not, uh, not a great night, but. December 3rd, he was just doing his job that night. But he was a hero to a lot of us and a lot of other people way prior to December 3rd. People down at Shaw's would say, here comes Paul Brotherton with the six ducklings all lined up. My husband was a hero in his life, not in his death. After that night, I decided that's what I wanted to do. Sealed the deal completely. I was around six years old when I knew I wanted to be a firefighter. I mean, seeing my dad come home from work, you know, and you smell the smoke on him when you give him a hug, that's kind of what I always wanted, and I love that smile growing up. He's following, of course, in his dad's footsteps. Um, he's wearing his father's badge. That badge was reserved for when one of Jerry's sons would come on the fire department, if they decided to. My brother, I'm sure he would be busting buttons. He'd be so proud of him. If I was pitching you a Hollywood movie where I said six brave men died while protecting the community they served. And within, you know, 20 years, seven sons of those firefighters would now be working as experienced firefighters in the same department? Nobody would buy that. And that's exactly what happened here. But we're proud to do the job that he did. And, uh, Personally, I hope to be a great firefighter someday like he was. I'm third generation. Uh, my grandfather's a firefighter. My father was on uh, my whole life uh, up until the fire. I mean, let's, let's be honest, it's, it's fun too. When we show up to a fire, for me, it's pure excitement. It's a double-edged sword because I know somebody's about to lose God knows whatever their life or property. But it's what we signed up to do. I absolutely love it. 
My brother Steve was right. There's a lot of emotions, a lot of adrenaline, a lot of excitement. But you just have to kind of keep it cool and just kind of go down that checklist and keep doing what you're doing. The meaning of being a firefighter to me, I mean, it's everything. It's life now. It's the brotherhood. I mean, the guys I work with are the best guys I've ever, ever met in my entire life, you know. <laughs> and I know that they'll be lifelong friends forever, too. It's probably one of the best jobs you can have. I know guys say you've won the lottery. It's definitely, I wouldn't want to do anything else. I love this city, love this department. So I said, this is where I want to be, this is my home. And everybody wears that, that pride of being a Worcester firefighter, but being from Franklin Street Station is probably, in my eyes, I mean, the best place to be. The nice thing for us is that both Jerry and my son, Peter, are working in that house with some of the Brothertons, and that group is tight. They're the future of the fire department and they're having children now, so I think that it's gonna be a long time that they'll have members that remember. Uh, I did, I did just become a father. Um, uh, October 1st, my son Jeremiah Michael Lucy the fourth was born. Pretty proud to, you know, have that name carried on. And uh, it's funny, because when he was born, a, uh, a fire engine came ripping by the hospital window, lights, sirens, and stuff, and you could hear it, and uh, it makes you think, Somebody was watching over, you know. Just weeks shy of the 20th anniversary of the cold storage warehouse fire, the unthinkable happened once again to the Worcester Fire Department. Lieutenant Jason Menard of Ladder 5 died in the line of duty as he heroically worked to save members of his team during a four-alarm fire. You know, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years. It just, that night changed everything for so many people. Worcester Fire Department does not look forward to December. Yeah, we think about them all the time and we do our job. I think that's how you honor guys that have passed on by just doing your job and taking care of the citizens of the city. Their faces, their names, their being have left an indelible mark on this community. Everybody knows where they were when they first heard about that fire. People in the community of Worcester have been amazing. They never forget. Every December 3rd, you see a big crowd of people out front, you know, and they're always here to support all the families and, and the memory of those guys. We have never forgotten these brave men and the ultimate sacrifice they made. We honor their devotion to duty and the seven sons who have followed in their father's footsteps. That is the greatest tribute of all. 20 years later, the bell again tolls to those who have selflessly given their lives for the good of their fellow man. Bringing back everybody, listening to the moment of silence, listening to the bells toll. I've been there for 20 years, and that just signifies that day was when six perished, and a whole department suffered. The brotherhood and sisterhood is pretty tight. It is a family, it is a connection that we all have. We're here for something bigger than ourselves. You know, that's what the Brotherhood's about. It's about support from all over. The fire service has always been very tight-knit. There are people that travel from overseas to come to the funerals. The warehouse fire was a wake-up call. Since then, in the last 20 years, we have better techniques and strategies, how we search buildings, how we mark buildings. Through tragedy, we learn, and we are given the chance through a tragedy, unfortunately, to turn things around and to make things better. 
I've seen the W6 stickers and t-shirts. I've seen them all over the place. It always makes me happy now when I see it because it, it means that I know that they know the story of the Worcester Six and I know that they know the story of my cousin. Jay, Jerry, Joe, Tim, Tom, Paul, we love you, we miss you, and we will never forget you.